beginning in verse 41, very familiar passage of Scripture. We often read this, uh, this passage after someone has been saved and to help them uh, give them steps in growing in the Lord. So Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, the Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so tonight I want to teach on the greatest asset of the church. And, and we find a lot of that right here, but it boils down to, to us going and reaching people uh, for the Lord Jesus, and the Lord will add to the church. It's always nice to get added to, unless it's problems, amen? We don't like those uh, too often, uh, but it's important to understand that it really is the Lord that builds the house. That he, he, we use our labors and our works to be able to, to facilitate that because he wants us to be a part of it. It's not just that we need to sit here and we just need to pray and all of a sudden we're going to have people just start flooding in our, in our building. It doesn't really work that way. Uh, we've tried before, I know. We, we, we do often pray that the Lord would send people here to help us, uh, to serve the Lord here with us. Uh, it, it, that's what it is. When you're here and you serve the Lord, you're serving with us. And we are serving and working together with God himself. And God is the one that will take all those efforts of what we did and apply them and draw them. See, we can't do much draw. You, you, you know, you talk about church's drawing power. I want you to understand nobody has more drawing power than God. He has the power to draw. And just think about that. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So it's important that we understand that. Now, uh, the majority to, of churches today are made up of mixed multitudes, and there's uh, damage has been done uh, to reputations and effectivenesses of some of the local church because of it, because you'll have people that have, there's loose living, for instance. In other words, uh, if, if, I, if people, people know we're churchgoers, I mean, they know that. Uh, everybody at work, they know I'm a pastor and a minister, and they that. But if if we go and uh, and we we act just like the world does, and that's what you would call loose living. You're living just like the world, just like you're not a Christian. That's that's pretty much what loose living uh, would be defined as. You're you're just living just like everybody else. Uh, you're, you're blending in, uh, and then they, they typically will take that and they will say that we're hypocrites because we are saying one thing and we're doing another. That, that's pretty much the definition of what you see for hypocrites. And a lot of people, and especially, oh man, probably in the last 10 to 12 years or more, or maybe even the last 20 years, 
Uh, it was a really big argument with people. Uh, and one of the number one reasons that people stayed out of church was because of the hypocrites that were in the church. Because if they're good and they're going to heaven, so am I. Because they're not doing anything different than I am. So uh, we, we see that that, could, that type of thing can really affect a local church in, in that aspect. So there's many things that can, uh, but you have these loose living and hypocritical people. They profess they know Christ, but they're denying him in their works. Remember, uh, when Jesus said that they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, right? And they're, they're not even in the same zip code as me, where, they're, where I'm at. But, they, but with their mouth, they are. But with their works, they're not. And that's why a church really has to be careful. And, you, uh, and you'll hear a lot of preaching on, on how we should live and, uh, according to the Bible, not according to the preacher, but according to the Bible. That's how I've always preached. I've always preached and taught, whether I was teaching a Sunday school class or I've taught uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in another avenue or I've, I've, I've taught or preached in a kid's camp or, or wherever it is. Uh, I, preach, uh, I preach or teach based on what the Bible has to say because really that's, that's the main thing. If I can't say the Bible says this, I really shouldn't be talking about it and telling people how to, uh, how to do this or that. And I, I, I don't even like to think of myself as doing that. When I get up here uh, or, or if we're down there or over here or wherever, if I'm teaching and I'm preaching and, and I'm doing this, it's not that I'm telling you anything. It's not that I am telling you how to live. It's not that I am telling you how you should behave or you should act or you should this or you should that. I'm repeating what God has to say. I'm letting you know God says this is how we should live. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't claim to be qualified to do any kind of get up here and tell you how to live. I, I would never do that. The only thing I can do is tell you and myself what God has to say. And then we encourage that. We encourage you to apply those things to your heart and to your life so that those kinds of things couldn't be said about you. That, oh, well, you, you say this, but you do this. Well, nobody needs to have that happen because it really does have, a, uh, it creates problems. Now, we know some people are backslidden believers, but some of them may not be saved. Now, not everybody that's in a church, even in a church faithfully, is saved. Remember that. Many, many times over the years, we've seen long-term members of the church realize that they have never asked Jesus to come into their heart and forgive them of their sin and put their faith and trust in his finished work and be saved. People, even in the church for as many as 55 years. That's the oldest one. Uh, that's the oldest longstanding member. And it was a church that my dad pastored in West Virginia. Just, and this lady was the epitome of morality. She lived one, I mean, she was just a wonderful little godly lady. She lived that way. To look at her, you would obviously think, there goes a Christian right there. She's always in the house of the Lord, doesn't seem to have a mean word to say about anybody, very helpful, very loving, very compassionate, and demonstrated all the things that you, would, you and I would look and attribute to someone being a Christian. This lady absolutely displayed all of that in her life. But it was God that revealed to her, he revealed to her that that was not salvation. That was just works. So we have to come to the place where we just acknowledge that, yes, God is telling me this. This is something that God says, 
And because God says it, we need to we need to really uh, analyze ourselves, our hearts, our lives, and, and try to put that into place. Because God said it, not because even the preacher said it. Okay, it's, it's God that speaks. I'm only a mouthpiece that speaks what God tells me to speak. Uh, the things that he shows me from the word of God, he shows them to me. And I know that I need them because there's not anything in this book that I don't need. Because there's nothing in this book that you don't need. Okay, we as God's people need this book. We need the Bible. We need the word of God to tell us what God says about things uh, and, and, and do our level best to adapt these things into our lives that we might not cause a problem that way. Now, we know that the unsaved people are a continual source of problem to God's uh, man and to the church uh, in general. The sheep are a wonderful group of people. The most wonderful people in the world are the people that belong to Jesus Christ in the local church. Amen. The most wonderful people ever. That's where they are. And so, uh, you know, I'm talking about saved people, not lost church members. I'm talking about saved ones. The problem with these goats or those that are not saved is not a seed problem, but the heart problem of the hearer, okay? You can't come to a Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church and not have the seed of the Word of God thrown all over your, the soil of your heart. You can't do that. God makes sure expressively that you get something from the word of God that's, that's thrown out there. However, we can see and notice by the parable of the sower uh, that was given that we, uh, we can either nurture and have that to, to grow and to produce something good, or we can choke it out. And there's many different ways to choke it out. Uh, and, and we're going to look at a, 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 diff a few different things from the parable of the sower, which most of you are already very familiar with, or at least should be. Uh, if you've been saved for many, uh, any length of time, you've probably heard a message uh, or, or, a, uh, or a hundred on, the, <laughs> on the, the parable of the sower. But we see that there's a wayside here. Because in Matthew 13, 4, it says, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. So there's a wayside here. That is a darkened heart. All right? They come once. They don't come back. They fail to understand the gospel. They don't care. Uh, it's, it just fell by the wayside. But thank God, I have to stop for a minute to say, thank God this seed was there. They got a chance to hear the gospel. They had a chance to believe. They had a chance when that word of God went out. It was, even though they weren't really in the right place. You know, they weren't really in the right place. They were by the wayside. Most people don't pay attention to the wayside until you have to pull off over there. You got something wrong or you got to stop for any reason and you have to pull off onto the shoulder. You pull off onto the wayside, out of the way of regular traffic. You're, you're, you're not really where you're intended to be. On the freeway, you're intended to be in those three lanes. And sometimes more, depending on where you are and where they have. You're not necessarily intended to be on the shoulder, stopped and out of the way. And uh, even, even though you're out of the way, you're still kind of not where you really should be. So that's 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 what we what we talk about when we're talking about a wayside hearer. They're darkened. They're not really in the place they ought to be, but they're still getting seeds thrown their way that hopefully something might take. Maybe there's a chance. There's a chance. I also in Matthew 13:19 
The Bible says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which is sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. All right, they're not understanding what you're giving them. They don't understand. There are people in this country, believe it or not, that have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. They have no knowledge even of God himself that they're, that they're, that they're actively thinking about. Now, God built that into them that you would know, but this were they willingly ignorant of, right? They knew him as God, but they glorified him not as God. So, God built it into everyone, but but these people just don't get what you're throwing. And so the devil comes along and snatches and, and catches away that seed so that it can't do anything on accident. He catches away out of the seed of the heart. This is he that received the seed by the wayside. Then there's a stony ground hearer, which is a hard heart. A lot of people have hard hearts. They've got hard hearts for many different reasons. Uh, things you go through in life can obviously create a stony heart. And it's not something typically that you would you would just walk out onto a stony patch like, uh, I don't know any of us that would get seeds, go out into our parking lot and just start throwing the seed. And expect something from it. Well, that's really not a good place. No, you got to have good soil, preacher. You you got to have dirt. You got to have water. You got to have nutrients from the earth that are given that that are going to give life to the seed that you have. Once the seed dies, life springs from it. Okay, and so uh, you have that stony ground here. They've got a hard heart. They might hang out for a little bit. They might, but hard-heartedness keeps them from being saved, and they close their ears to the truth and are soon offended. All right? In Matthew chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, Some fell upon stony places where they had much earth, and... Forthwith, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. See, you could actually get something out of throwing some seed out in the parking lot. You might get the, the thing that dies if there's a little earth there. You might get a little sprout but it can't hang out, it can't stay, it can't flourish, it can't grow, it can't mature into what it is designed to do because it has no depth. It's a seed that's too shallow to have anything done. So when the heatness, the the, the sun rises and, and the heat comes down, it has no way of keeping itself going. And it withers. And in uh, verses 20 and 21 of the same chapter, chapter 13, uh, the Bible says, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and uh, and, and with joy receiveth it. Now, I want you, before I go on, I want you to understand that that's a, that is a brilliant place to start right there. You're hearing, and you're joyfully receiving. If we don't joyfully receive, it's not going to go any farther than that. So even up to this point, they're doing well. Yet, hath he no root in himself, but dureth, or endureth, for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word By and by, he is offended. We see that two different types of people already uh, would would be turned away because of just 
at just being offended by the word. Uh, these, these tribulations and persecutions arise because of the word by and by he is offended. Now, thirdly, there's the thorny ground hearer. This is an unrepentant heart. They want heaven, but they also want this world. So they, they use salvation as a means of escape the wrath of God, and then they're determined to live a life however pleases them. This is a thorny ground type of person here. Uh, and and it's, it's still, it's very sad. Uh, all these ones that we've talked about so far, this is a sad state to be in spiritually. It's a very sad state to be in. And so it's important. We're encouraged over and over in the word to hear the word, to receive the word, and joyfully, because it's the word of God, not the word of man. That's what it is. If you really look at it, that's what the Bible says. And so you, 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 you hear it, and we know that there's outer hearing and inner hearing, right? They're receiving it, okay? And so, but here's the thing. This is an unrepentant heart. They're just going to continue to do what they want to do. And God wants us to hear. He wants us to receive but he also wants us to apply what we're learning to help get us to a place where we can be self-sustaining. With any crops that you plant, any of them, you have to get them to a place of self-sustainability. You know what? When they're weak and they're just growing, sometimes you have to, and you, you might have seen this, especially with little trees, uh, of some kind that they'll they'll have them kind of they'll have them kind of like uh, secured on both sides so that it grows straight. It's providing strength from this side and this side, and it's staked into the ground so that it's that it, it needs a little help. You know, like sometimes you might need a little help when you're getting up off the couch. Amen. You might, or a chair, you might need somebody to say, hey, up, oh, yeah, help me out here. Pull us up here. And you might be a little wobbly when you first get up, but okay, now I'm good. I'm up. I found my center. I found my gravity. I found my balance. Now we're good. Thank you for the help. That is what the Word of God is trying to do for us because it is, it, it is going out to secure you to, the, to the, the ground that is the rock of Jesus Christ so that we grow up straight and good. And we can then become fruitful as a result of the good care and the TLC that is going into the, the Christian. Uh, and, and so we need to receive it. And don't be afraid to let the word of God anchor you. You know what? It, it can be a little alarming sometimes if, if all of a sudden there's just something around you. And it's kind of holding you. Now, but other times, you know, you can look at a hug, for instance. Look what a hug will do. Now, it's, it, 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 it's, it involves holding somebody close to you, and you're holding him. That's not a natural state for them to be in. Having somebody's arms around you tightly, but, you know, and sometimes they can even get a little squirmy. Because they're not used to that. They're not used to the holding factor. Okay? But we need, to, we need to understand that God wants to hold you. He said, I will uphold you with my right hand. God wants to hold you. He wants to secure you, to fasten you, to allow you to start growing in one direction the direction towards himself. He wants you to grow up. He doesn't want you to grow sideways. Okay? So it's important. But these people, they, they just don't, they just, all they want is what they want. Now, 
The next one is the is one of the best ones you can be, and that is the good ground hearer. Now, what would this is a receptive heart? They hear it, they receive it, they're saved, they apply it. Many times, you know, uh, I've, I've mentioned the fact that Dr. Willette, I heard this, uh, R.B. Willette, I've heard him say this so many times uh, in regards to the, the, the Bible being preserved for us. But he says this, he said, he said, inspiration without preservation is irrelevant, right? It means it's nothing. But at the same time, we can look at it that you can hear and receive, but if you don't apply, it's irrelevant. You can be a hearer, you can be a receiver, but if you're not applying, if it's not, if you don't have the application of what you're hearing and receiving to what you're supposed to do. Listen, if you have a phone update or an update on your computer, that, that update is there. It's there. It says, update me, here I am. Hit the button, schedule your install. You have it. You've received the upgrade. You've received the update. But now you have to apply the update. You have to schedule the install. You have to click install now at or click uh, 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 click over to schedule a specific time for that installation. Because having that update and never applying the update would make that update irrelevant to your phone. You're not going to get everything that's in that update because you never applied the update. Same thing. Uh, many people uh, in this building have used coupons. You have a coupon for $5 off of something. You've received it. You heard about it. You received it. You have it. You, you even go and you buy the product. You get the product and you've got it loaded up on the, on the counter and you're, and you're about ready to pay. But you know what happens? What happens if you don't give them the coupon? nothing. You get charged full price for it. That coupon has just been rendered useless at that transaction because you didn't apply your discount code or your dis if you're ordering stuff online and you have a discount code, you have to apply. They say, apply your discount code. Type in your code and hit apply discount code, and then that then when you click that, then it then it adjusts the total to reflect whatever your discount was. Application is important. You, it, you just can't you just can't receive the word and hear the word. You have to apply it, or you're going to be not benefited by the spiritual update. God wants to update us every time we're in here. You know what? Because, oh, yeah, a little chink in the armor there. Oh, yep. Sad spirit over here. Oh, yep. Got this going on. We constantly need heavenly updates. And God will have us here, and God will have a message prepared, and God will let it go out, and you've got to hear it, you've got to receive it, but you've got to apply it for it to even make any sense. If you were to go and go through all the years that it takes to become a surgeon and you never go and you never use anything that you've practiced, all that money, time, and knowledge means nothing. Except that you've, you know, you've boosted the local economy there at, that, at the school that you went to. You have to apply what you're learning. So it's a good ground. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 8 and 9, it says, But other fell on into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. You'll find that a lot in the Revelation when he was talking to the church. When he sent letters to the churches, 
He would say, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So it's, it's imperative that we listen, that we receive it, but that we also apply it so that it can do us good, okay? The good ground hearer. And then in Matthew uh, 13, 23, but he that receiveth, receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. So there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a formula there. You're hearing the word, you're receiving it, but you also understand it. This is why understanding, we went through an entire year with the theme of understanding. Because if you don't, you've missed it all. We have to understand what's, what's, what's here. Uh, and it goes on, in, and, but you uh, also understand it, but you're bearing fruit, whether it's 60 or 100-fold or 30-fold, whatever it is. Now, notice, it was the seed that brought forth the fruit. Salvation that works, not a sinner that works. You see how easy that that is. That's important. It's salvation that works. Now, the greatest asset to the local church is its people. What makes these people so special? It's the work of the Lord in their lives. The church would have nothing if not for the people. You are the church. But what happens when you're not, when the church isn't there, then it can't do any works, right? So the people of the local church, that is the greatest asset that we have here is right there, looking in the mirror. You look in the mirror and you can say, I am the greatest asset that Temple Baptist Church has. And you're right. Now, we know we have God. Because I know right now somebody's saying, no, no, you're wrong. It's God. It's Jesus. We already have that. We're, we're talking about God established the church and also gave it people with gifts to use in the church. Without people, there's no gifts to be used in the church. There's no gifts of anything. There's no gift of music. There's no gift of preaching or teaching. There's no gift of anything else of even just being a handyman or a friendly encourager there's no there's nobody to use gifts without people so quickly i want to just throw out a few of these things number one the people of the church are a forgiven people forgiven people love god and people that love god don't cause those issues because they love god we we, we love him, and therefore we go. Now, we, we see the compassion of his forgiveness, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And, and of course, we, you can look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, talking about how God is rich in mercy and great love where, where he loved us. He's raised us together. He's made us sit in heavenly places uh, and all of that, but there's the completeness of his forgiveness as well. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened, that means made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespass. Secondly, the people of the church are a faithful people. Faithful people love the church and therefore can be depended on. That's part of what made uh, the, the pillars of our church pillars because they were always there. You could always count on seeing uh, uh, all those people that, that we've mentioned, that I mentioned Sunday, and, and Mr. Hipsley, and Grover, and Ron, and we still have faithful people that you could count on seeing them because they're there. They're faithful people. They're decided to, to love the Lord. They've decided to, to be a faithful people. You can depend on those people to be there. 
okay? Now, they're, you know, and that means being faithful to services or, uh, or, or forgiving or their service to God, all of those things that are required in stewards and that a man be found faithful, right? That it's, God expects faithfulness. That's the Bible. You may not like to hear it, but that's the Bible. God expects faithfulness. He demands faithfulness. The same way that a husband and a wife, in the context of their marriage, demand faithfulness out of each other. There's no room for option here. There's no room for you to say, I may be faithful to you. Because there's a relationship, there's a covenant. Forget not that we are in a covenant with Jesus Christ himself. The covenant is that he saves our soul, forgives us our sin, creates a new creature, and we respond with faithfulness, holiness, which is a reasonable service. It's not unreasonable to be found faithful. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You know what we do when we see people that have been faithful in the ministry, we say, wow, look what a testament of faithfulness. When I think of faithfulness, I immediately, and with no disrespect to anybody else, I, I, I recognize faithfulness here, but I, want, I, I, just, I happen to think of my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. They have been faithful for over 30 years to a place uh, out in Nowhereville. Where it can seem very, you talk about discouragement. You have you already have income issues because everybody over there is on a fixed income of sorts. So you're not going to have overwhelming capital or overwhelming uh, thing, but God meets the need. There's been many times when they were wondering if they would be able to continue up there. They stayed faithful. They showed up. They showed up. They were counted on. You could count on them to show up. And that's what it is. And that's a reasonable thing to expect out of somebody that you have redeemed. It's a reasonable expectation that God would say, be faithful to me. Be true to me. Make me the center of your thought. Make me the center of your life. Because when we do, all that other stuff is not hard to do. You realize coming to church is no longer a hard thing to do when Jesus is the center of your world. It really isn't hard. It's not. People should never be mad that God wants you to be here. What is that? I don't know. People of the church are a fellowshipping people. These are people that love the Lord and each other, and they have very little conflict. They're overlookers. You know what? Sometimes you got to learn to be is an overlooker because we're just flesh. And nine, nine times out of ten, somebody will do something, but when they do something, and it maybe, maybe you're offended by it, maybe it's not actually that. Maybe it's all the hundred things before that, before you got to that moment. So we have to kind of just take it as it is, overlook it, and pray for them. Maybe ask them if they're okay. Hey, is there anything I can help you pray with? Or you seemed a little stressed. Is, is everything okay? Is there something that I can help you pray over? Maybe we can, bend, bend, you know, uh, the more people to pray, the better. The better it is. And it's because they love the Lord. It's because they love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one for another. Fourthly, the people of the church are a fruitful people. Fruitful people love souls and try to be a witness for Christ. Does that mean you're going to be the most sold out, dedicated, soul winning, knock on doors eight hours a day? No, it doesn't always mean that you're going to be that way. But when you take opportunity for what's put in front of you, 
And yes, it means that. You're at least conscious of those that need a Savior. And for us to be conscious of that, that has to go up in priority in our mind. All right? Now, a lot of things that I've learned in my training, whether it's for fire or a medical situation that goes on, you have to have certain things higher in your priorities than others when you're coming up to a scene. Your very first thing that you do is, is it even safe for me to go in there? Is it safe? Is the scene safe? Is there any hazards that could make this deadly for me? Because I can't go in. If someone's in a, a puddle of water being electrocuted, I can't run in there or I'm going down too. And now I've just added to the problem instead of being a help to the problem. And with that, that would be an anal uh, analyzing the scene. Okay, so if I know I need something shut off, electricity or de-energizing happening, then we could shut that, that, we could get somebody to shut that down. Then it becomes safe for me to operate. And when you're dealing with people in a medical uh, issue, you have to get just the top, top things. Okay, you, you're looking for, okay, do you have chest pain or are you looking for signs of stroke or signs of heart attack? You're looking for like really big things. To, to, to give you an indication how to proceed. There are things that are prioritized. Now, in a church, it's the same way. For your spiritual life, it's the same way. For witnessing, it's the same way. For me to be able to go out and, 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 and be a witness anywhere I am, I have to now come to the conclusion in my mind that when I'm out, anybody and everybody I may come in contact with may need Jesus. Treat them as lost until otherwise. That's a problem. Do you know Jesus? Do you know that you can be in heaven, that you can have all your sin forgiven? Do you know without a doubt if you died right now, you'd be in heaven? If not, I can take two or three minutes and I can tell you about that. Listen, we have to be more conscious of that if we're going to be fruitful. All right? So... And, and also, I'm going to just throw this out because uh, I, I just had this thought not too long ago. But here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to do something for me. I would like it if you have not won a soul to the Lord. I want you to come to me privately and tell me. Because the next time we have a service and someone is coming down to be saved, that could be your first. I could call on you to be, be a worker, and I could call for someone else to help if you, if you want that extra support, okay? But we could, we could cultivate souls for the master for you. There's no reason that one person has to do it. There's no reason that even just one for this one or one for that one. We, you know, it, there, there might come a time... Uh, and I know, I know that you guys, you especially uh, the Specs and my parents. Uh, I know there's many people in here that have won souls. I already know that. Now, have you have any of you had to lead someone to the Lord that was of the opposite sex? We know that you did because you you met Tracy and, and was able to win her to the Lord. So I already know that you can work with that, right? Now, obviously, we we typically try to say, okay, if there's a, a lady that comes down, let's have a lady go. But you know what? If there's no ladies available, we might have to have a guy come up and say, hey, can I show you how to be saved? And that's okay. But if you haven't won somebody, the Lord, I want you to let me know. God is still saving people in this church at unexpected times. Last Wednesday, just one week ago, Someone was, I led someone to the Lord right here at the altar, all right? But that could have been somebody else. I could have been like, hey, you know what? Uh, can you come over here? Or can you come over here? If you want to if, if you want to be a helper, let me know. Because I would love to be able to incorporate that so that you have souls to meet the master with. Why should you sit there when they're, they're ready? They're already ready. They're at an altar, 
They're already ready. They're primed and ready. That fruit's just dangling by a thread. All you got to do is go. Bloop. You could do that. You could be that. You could have. Let me know. So there's fruitful, and I want you to understand that fruitful people are holy people. They're abiding people. They're people that are soul-loving. They love souls. And the last point that I want to get out real quick is the people of the church are a fragrant people. Fragrant people love worship and are a blessing to the services. Fragrant because of their praise for God. Their praise, and remember what we told you the praise was? Is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. That's what praising God is. Psalm 22, 3, but thou art holy, O thou, and that inhabitest the praises of Israel. And they're fragrant because of their position with God. Song of Solomon 4, 10, how fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse, how much better is thy love than wine and the smell of thine ointments than all spices? Hey, that's love. The greatest asset of the church is you. Remember that. Isn't that kind of a confidence booster? Is that anybody feel encouraged by that today? That you're not nothing? that you're not a number, that you're not a seat dweller, but you are one of the greatest assets we have because of what God has put in you. Well, that's pretty good right there. That's pretty good stuff. So that's all I have for, uh, for that subject, for the, uh, for the, prayer, or the, uh, the message tonight.